Yeah. And uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Thomas Gideon from Montana State who will talk to us. And of course, I've forgotten the title. You have to put up your screen, share your screen. And... Yep. All right. So uh, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this was uh, this uh, introduction for 10 minutes was actually very good for me to relax a little bit and uh, get to know who, uh, who is in the audience. Um, so here, this is kind of a maybe slightly um, um, unusual topology talk. Uh, but there is a topology, believe me, some, somewhere hidden in there, and I'll try to mention it at least some point. Uh, so again, this is a joint work between um, our group here and a uh, group at Rutgers, uh, headed, headed by Constantine. So we'll talk about, what I'll talk about is uh, dynamics of gene regulatory networks. So what biologists uh, think of network is something which looks like this, okay? So it's a great mess of, <clears throat> of vertices and edges. Edges are usually um, uh, oriented and uh, they have uh, either plus or minus sign, which represent uh, the information that the, the node, which is some kind of a biochemical compound, gene, protein, mRNA, is affecting uh, the other node either in positive direction or negative direction, i.e. it upregulates or downregulates uh, that target. Now, <clears throat> These networks are often constructed based on kind of a different uh, strength or evidence. Uh, some are simply correlation. Um, some have uh, informational binding affinities, i.e., if, if A influences B, it actually bind. They actually do know they bind to the promoter region of the other one. Um, most of the studies are deletion studies, where you take one of the <coughs> um, actors here, you delete it from a cell. And then you see if the tar what what goes up and what goes down in the cell. If it goes up, you say, oh, that there's a negative influence. If it goes down, it's a positive influence, right? Because you you took the edge out. Um, but in, in general, again, the, the the information is not, I would say, 100% uh, uh, accurate. I would say. And the central question people are asking is, how does this work? And when I say, how does this work? I really think about dynamics uh, <clears throat> and dynamics, maybe sometimes it's not really dynamics where they think about how this, how this network kind of uh, reacts to perturbations, um, um, different growth conditions, uh, different situations, how it controls it, its homeostasis. And this is extremely important obviously for, uh, for health and for other, <clears throat> uh, like this is human cells. So the, the kind of central question, which I'll try to formulate um, abstractly in, in several layers uh, the, the question here, which is kind of proximal question, is how do, how do we get this kind of network and decide what is its dynamics? Okay, and this is, I'll explain what that really means later, but this is a, a different way of um, answering or kind of a framing the question is we kind of know the structure of the system and I would like to understand what is a function, how, what are the uh, different ways how this thing can work. Yet another way which uh, biologists use is to as for as correspondence between genotype and phenotype. We have completed the human genome about 20 years ago, and we're not that much smarter about how these cells work, how to fix um, cells which are which uh, present tumor or you know kind of cancerous phenotype. So there's not really there, there's a very complex relationship obviously between understanding how uh, kind of a structure of the system and then and the phenotype. On on a um, there's one of my riff on topology here. Um, clearly, you know, one of the ideas of, of topology is uh, understanding how you move from local to global information. Here, the local information can be thought of as presented by these individual edges and nodes and kind of local information, how things inter interact. But we would like to understand how the whole system works on a global, global scale. So um, let me focus on <clears throat> this first question, which is, um, what is what actually is dynamics? What, what do we want to actually understand out for this in the system? If if we adapt kind of a traditional view, which majority of uh, people would, uh, i.e., kind of coming from physics, that that dynamics means that there's some kind of ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation system underneath this, um, and I would like to understand how the trajectories of that system work. I would like to predict what those trajectories do. Uh, for this network. Now, if that's our view, uh, if that's our benchmark, they, the, the problem is obviously extremely ill-posed and we'll probably not be able to answer that question. Um, even if I restrict myself to kind of a class 
of models where these uh, the influence from one node to another is monotone. Um, so these are kind of monotone sign interaction functions. Uh, it, it is still a uh, a big problem because we don't know what nonlinearities non 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 are. We don't have any of a first principle uh, understanding of how one gene affects the other. Um, so we can use all these kind of nonlinearities which are listed on the bottom. And I'll talk about, about the third one a little bit. Um, we have no idea what parameters are, how these parameters uh, in, you know, param parameters which influence what nonlinearity I have, how steep, how high, uh, those things are essentially unmeasurable uh, on definitely on a level of single cell. In populations, you can probably get some averages sometimes. Um, initial conditions are clearly uh, also unknown. So if I think about, if I want to predict what dynamics is, I'm, I'm not going to probably have a too much success. Okay, people are doing this, uh, but you, you often see things where people have, you know, 37, 30 dimensional uh, parameter space and 12 dimensional uh, phase space, and then they sample parameters. Um, and, you know, obviously the sampling size is going to be minuscule um, in that size. So the way how can one can address this ill posedness is uh, uh, there are several ways, right? So one, is kind of on the on the network side, is to say, well, you know, biologists should do better experiments. They should figure out exactly what the network is, and figure out what the what the nonlinearities are and parameters are. But again, the, 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 there's no first principle models. Uh, these models are kind of descriptive, and so this is not really realistic because you have to measure in every single cell essentially hundreds of different compounds. Things are changing. It's it just not that's not going to work. The other way how people thought about working on this was to, uh, and, and solving here is should be thought of in quotation mark, they kind of look at a very small networks as I, as I, as I described here in, the, in those little pictures. Um, and they call them motifs. This is a work of Yuri alone from uh, Weizmann um, from Israel. And, you know, writing a really simple models, you can kind of make a very vague statements like, um, the second motif will likely produce a pulse because the direct edge from the top to the bottom is going to upregulate the the third, the bottom node, and then a kind of a later uh, negative uh, feedback coming through from the side node is going to kind of uh, make that go away. So you can see some kind of a pulse. I mean, these are very vague uh, ideas. Again, are not founded uh, mathematically. And the biggest problem with this kind of way of working on things is that the scaling of this ideas is very problematic. It is not clear if I see a motif like this in the network, which I showed on our first slide, um, embedded someplace, that the understanding of this little small motif will have any, any, any you know, kind of correspondence to uh, what happens uh, for a network as a whole. So facing with this, uh, let's work on the dynamic side. And what we would like to maybe do is to rethink what we expect um, to get out of dynamics, okay? So if I have a very ill-defined idea of a network with uh, not really well-parameterized functions, maybe we should scale down or what we think about dynamics. So that's what I'd like to talk about um, from now on. Um, and I'll um, start with one approach which people have used uh, in, in biology which is um, using Boolean network models. And in this case, you essentially discretize everything to the, to the biggest possible way and say, okay, each node, each gene is either on one or off zero. And you update the state uh, of the network from one to zero or vice versa based on some Boolean function uh, based on the states of the input. So let me explain that. And I'll kind of carry this little small example, a small cartoon with me uh, throughout the talk. Here's a node four, which has a um, three inputs, two are positive, one is negative, the red is negative. Um, and um, you can kind of set up some function, let's say F4 here is a four for the node four, is a Boolean function where I list for all a triple of zeros and ones, all possible states of the input, what the uh, update what the updated state is going to be um, of the node four. Okay, 
Now, uh, in general, you have one of these functions for every node in the network. So you collect these, each of them, if I is a function from the BN, B is just a set of zero, one, two, two point set. Um, and then if I collect them together, I get a function uh, from BN to BN, and that's my phase space. My phase space, my dynamics is, um, is a Boolean hypercube of dimension N, and every time and, and uh, a mapping on this is going to be my update function, my dynamics. Now there's, there's problems with this, obviously, and problems um, in kind of when I compare this type of model with biology here, that's what I like to focus on. If it is not really clear uh, for a particular gene or a protein, what does, it, what does it really mean on or off? There's not really a well-defined um, threshold, if you want, uh, which is fixed, where the gene A, if it's bigger than some kind of uh, concentration is going to be on, and, and the other one may be off. I mean, this is not really clear. The other one, which is more subtle, which I'll try to address, um, is that it kind of, and this is again, more, more subtle, is that if I, if I update the, uh, the state four, the state four is being updated, it always acts the same way on its downstream targets, which are the two blue points on the right. Um, and that may not be always the case because the four is really just kind of some gene uh, which binds with different affinities to different targets. So it may uh, act like it's on with respect to one of them, but off with respect to the other one. But this Boolean setup always assumes everything works the same way. The obvious big problem is parameterization. Right? There's no parameters in Boolean network. I mean, there's some, which I'll describe in a second, but you just kind of say, this is my Boolean function. Now, how do you know what that is, is not very clear, uh, or not very founded in the data. Uh, and also it is, there's no like bifurcation theory because you cannot like change continuously one Boolean function to the other and ask like, what's the, uh, there's no, no way to understand how changes in your um, in your assumptions affect the results. I was thinking about parameters. If we go to dynamics, um, again, I said that the dynamics is this mapping F, um, which I'll call a synchronous update, which kind of means that you, you, you take all the genes in your network and you update their states at the same time, right? Because you apply this, this uh, map F. But that kind of synchrony is not really present in any living organism. Uh, so you can say, well, okay, but I don't want to do that. Maybe what has to happen is that these genes are updated um, in different order. I mean, first I update uh, state of four and then maybe five and then three and then one. And it's not really cl clear what kind of schedule is natural. How do I study all possible schedules? And so these kind of things are, are problematic if you, if you do these kind of Boolean models that have to be addressed. The big advantage uh, is that this provides a finite description of dynamics. I mean, there's a finite many states, you can iterate and you kind of get results. And people have, are using this um, in, you know, pretty sizable networks to, to try to understand what dynamics is. So what I like to do here um, is to kind of describe a, um, a different way to handle this and keep the advantages and, and address some of those problems. So, um, First, I'm going to replace, so in if each node, each, each gene, I will assume not to have just the value one and zero in terms of expression level, but it will actually have a continuous expression level, which will be uh, kind of my param parameter here. So I'll replace the, the zero by kind of a low, low, and the value of L is going to be a parameter, and one by a high. So each gene could have a different Ls and Us, and these two levels of expression, high and low, will be separated by a threshold. So here's kind of uh, a, a graph expression of this. Again, if I if the A is, has a continuous expression, but the B is going to feel the low expression or it's the, it's the low expression, it affects B at a low level uh, below threshold A and at the high level at the threshold U. This is a positive regulation. The more A I have, the more B grows, um, the negative regulation is going to be the opposite, it kind of goes down, right? So this is kind of what, what I'm thinking about in terms of these functions. And again, I'm going to put these to be continuous parameters, L, U, and theta, um, 
uh, for a particular connection from A to B. The second part, um, I would like to, you know, I address this idea of, of that, the, that the effect is the same for all downstream genes. So this is kind of my traditional Boolean setup. Here, I'm going to say, well, I will actually have two different Boolean, Boolean quote unquote functions. So then I replace all the zeros by L's and all the um, ones by U's. And then I have two different functions. One uh, is how the four affects five and how the, how the six, how the four affects six. So I replace these, this one function by two functions. Um, and then, and here's the kind of the, the important slide here. I'm going to describe how you, how you go from these Boolean function descriptions and think about Boolean functions to continuous descriptions um, in terms of parameter space. Okay. And again, I, I did this first step is <clears throat> replacing this L's and uh, the zeros and ones by the L's and U's, but now these Boolean functions will correspond to some continue, some domains in a parameter space. Let me explain how that works. So you can, I can summarize um, the, the table of the Boolean function in the middle by the, by the picture on the right, okay? Where I list all the input patterns, uh, which is eight of them, and they form a partial, partial order. Zero, zero is the lowest, one, one is the highest. And then I'll, uh, I kind of marked each node by a blue dot if, if the result of that input is going to be a value one of the function and a red dot if it's zero. And you can see that uh, that is, you know, can, you can put some, some uh, threshold function or some threshold in between uh, the red and blue dots. Um, and that's how I can think about this Boolean function. In the same way, if I now go to my continuous description, I replace the hypercube on the right side uh, by, and again, this is a choice here, by making a choice of summing up, right? Instead of writing, so L1, L, so these L values are the va low values coming from one, two, three. They form a partial order. And then again, I'm drawing one of these functions, which goes to um, node five. There's a threshold th theta five, four associated to that uh, edge, which separates uh, the values of zero, the blue dots and the red dots, the blue uh, zero one, okay? And now I can express this uh, this, this hypercube in terms of algebraic expressions. So what I'm trying to say here is that the, the sums of L's, the two red inputs are lower than the threshold theta phi four and all the blue guys are above the threshold. So I'm expressing now the, the Boolean function, i.e. if you are over threshold, you are one, if you're below threshold, you are zero in terms of this big, big long inequality. So the Boolean function on top is expressed in terms of a uh, set of inequalities. Okay. So with that idea, um, I can start thinking about the geometry of the parameter regions, uh, which, which correspond to choices of these monotone Boolean functions. So for instance, in, in this node four, I can make the following choice, which correspond to the, the first, I'm looking at order of thresholds, one threshold is from four to five, the other one from uh, four to six. I just select one of them. And then I say, um, all right, the, the two Boolean functions correspond to the next two lines, which is the set of inequalities between um, the inputs coming in and those thresholds. Now this collection here um, is a domain um, in, in the high dimensional space. And I can, the neighboring domain clearly is the one where I change one inequality. So if I take one of the expressions from the right and move through a uh, threshold or vice versa, that's a, that's a domain, that's a new domain. It's a new set of Boolean functions. And uh, that domain is my neighbor uh, through a codimension one uh, surface, the hyperplane or something. The hyperplane in this case, but in general, if the, if the uh, summation of these inputs is replaced by different function could be a more complicated um, uh, nonlinear non surface. Uh, <clears throat> so the, I'm gonna represent the structure, the ge geometry of these parameter regions, parameter domains, each of which represents a particular collection of Boolean functions as a node of a parameter graph. And 
Uh, so this particular thing, which I'm showing here, is a node of so, something called parameter factor graph, PG4, because I'm looking at the, at the node four. If I collect all of them, so if I go through every single node of the of the of the uh, network, and I do a product of these graphs, I get a parameter graph for the entire network. Again, each node is a open domain. Uh, the two nodes are 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 uh, are have an edge between them. Uh, be, if if there is a one inequality changes between those two collections. Now this parameterizes right. This is a continuous space parameterization of the collection of Boolean functions. So now I know how to do kind of bifurcations because I can take this and it's a big space of all the possible L's and U's and thetas, which I have here. Um, but in this space, going from one domain to another domain means I'm changing one particular uh, monotone Boolean function in one particular node. So the... Um, so this geometry it kind of underlies the constructions which will which will be be doing. What is important to note is that um, the parameter graph or parameter factor graph for one particular uh, node can be computed once in the lifetime of the universe. It doesn't have to be computed every single time you deal with a new network, because this only depends on the kind of local structure. Like for instance, here on the right side, I have a node which has a single input and two outputs. There'll be two thresholds, which I have to deal with. Uh, the function itself will be very simple because there's only one input, which is either L or U. Uh, but on the left side, you see a structure of these open domain. This is a parameter graph. Um, the top uh, six nodes will be the ones which the thresholds are in one order. The bottom one will be different order. I'm not going to write what, what these orders are, but it's just basically how many ways you can take the symbols L and U and, and put uh, a theta one and theta two in between them. Okay. So that's kind of the parameter graph and that can be computed and we computed it. The more complicated graphs um, are much bigger. This is a one where I have two inputs and three outputs. Uh, the three outputs have three thresholds that can be uh, there's a six different six. What is it? Three factorial six different possibilities. What you see on the on the right side is one six of the entire parameter graph. Um, these, I mean, there's more details that I need to talk about. The black uh, dots are the one where, which these two different components connect, or more than two components connect to with each other. So, but this is all computed. Uh, we have done uh, constantly. The students have now done, and I, I stand corrected, all the four inputs um, uh, uh, parameter graph and some of the five ones for arbitrary number of outputs. So this is principle computable. And once I have computed this, every time somebody gives me a network, I can just take a product and that gives me essentially collection, collections of all possible monotone Boolean functions, which are compatible with the network I started with. So that, that's a kind of a construction of um, which tries to address the issues which we started. So, so the on and off we addressed because now we, we have a parameter instead of that U and L low and high value and those can change. Um, we addressed the downstream sensitivity because we have now collection of monotone Boolean function, not just one of them. And obviously parameterization, we now deal with a, a very large um, continuous parameter space, which we decompose into these domains and the geometry of that is captured by the parameter graph. What we have to still talk about is this kind of dynamics. How do you actually associate to each of uh, these parameter domains, i.e. parameter node in a parameter graph a, with a collection of monotone Boolean maps? How do, you, how do you get a dynamics uh, with that? Well, Basically, let's just make an example here. As, I, as we started and talked about for a long time now, the node four of this network, there's a set of two Boolean functions. At each parameter, there's a set of two Boolean functions that are different at each different parameter domain. Um, and so if I get the one parameter node gives me a collection of all these sets of Boolean function, a set for each node. And then the phase space is going to, if I, if I think about a phase space, again, continuous phase space, which is at least in principle, where each 
a node has a expression level which is continuous. So the, the, the horizontal axis here represents the X4, the vertical represents X1, obviously this is in high dimensional space. And um, the, there's thresholds, these thresholds which are attached to each of the edges divide the space in these domains. So I put a big black blue dot in one of the domains. If you are in that domain, then um, you, the input to all the monotone Boolean functions are specified. Okay. So the monotone Boolean functions, which correspond to the parameter node, so I'm sitting in one parameter node, which is a collection of Boolean functions. Um, if I'm in one of these domains, I know exactly what the, in, what, what the input uh, strings are, else and use, uh, depending on where in respect to other thresholds uh, the state is. So I can just evaluate those monotone Boolean functions and get a different domain. Generically, that evaluation is going to end up with, um, with other domain, okay? This is your synchronous update uh, of Boolean function. Now, since I'm looking at continuous space of expressions, I don't wanna have a discontinuous jump in the expression levels. So instead I'll represent this as a so-called asynchronous update. I, I'm going to allow dynamics to move from my original uh, domain to the neighboring domain in the direction of, uh, of my synchronous update. Okay? And that can be defined very carefully and very precisely. So now, uh, essentially this picture I can capture again in a graph, which I'll call a state transition graph, where each of these domains in the state space is represented by a vertex, by a node, and um, dynamics is based again on the asynchronous update of the monotone Boolean functions, uh, which are specified by the parameter node. Okay. And um, th these state transition graphs could be still pretty sizable. I mean, if I'm looking at, uh, uh, at the network with say, you know, 10, 15 nodes, then I'll have at least two to the 10 or two to the 15 or more. Um, nodes in the state transition graph, a lot of this information is, is not relevant to the kind of long-term dynamics we're interested in. So instead of looking at that information, I, I um, um, kind of summarize it in, in a condensation graph or something which is called, uh, if, if I look at the um, strongly connected path components of the graph, then those are nodes of a Morse graph and then there's a reachability condition between these two, these, uh, these uh, connected components, which are also uh, enshrined in the Morse graph. So this Morse graph here is very simple. I'll show you more complicated Morse graphs uh, as we go on. So to summarize this whole construction, um, we start with a, with a network. And uh, I construct this kind of parameter graph, which is Really, I see it as a geometry which parameterizes the logic. Right? So this, uh, the logic for all the possible monotone Boolean functions which are compatible with a network are, uh, this collection is parameterized by uh, open domains, open sets of, of the parameter space, which I introduced. And then that is uh, collected as, as a parameter graph with nodes representing domains and the edges, uh, co-dimension one, connections or uh, boundaries. So this is parameter node is some kind of inequalities of this type. And from that, I can construct state transition graph, which is my captures my dynamics. And I summarize that dynamics in a Morse graph. Okay. Uh, maybe I should notice here in the Morse graph that we can put some annotation to the Morse graph. Uh, I can tell you where the fixed point is. So the FP here represents a fixed point, which is uh, a node which has a self loop on it which actually does have, uh, it's not like a fixed point. And the zero one tells you where in, in, the, in the kind of discrete grid uh, that thing lies. The FC uh, can be, it's an annotation for something which we call full cycle, which is a set of domains which are connected in a circular fashion. This could be not just uh, something which has a topology of a torus, but something which can have a much more complicated topology, but every every uh, node of a network changes its, uh, changes its state at least once along this um, set of paths. 
So the current work, so this is kind of the, the structure of construction, which we do. Uh, what we're trying to prove right now is that is the following. So this is kind of where the topology also comes in. And again, more of this I constantly will be much, much better to talk about this because that's his focus more. So the, I talked about uh, this dynamics as generated by um, the kind of asynchronous update of these monotone Boolean maps. There's a different way to do that. We can, we can actually look at um, a different ordinary differential equation with right-hand sides, which are these discontinuous right-hand sides, which I uh, showed at the very beginning. And if you just kind of follow the solutions of that ODE, it will do the asynchronous update, which I presented, because the state of ODE always changes continuously. So um, the, the question which arises and which is very natural is to say, well, if I take the data which I presented, the Morse, uh, Morse graph, a state transition graph, and then actually consider ODEs which are legitimate ODEs, uh, which have nonlinearities which are smooth, but somewhat somehow C0 close to the one above. So something which I was trying to put together here at the bottom, uh, something smooth. Uh, do I get information about that dynamics, which is now completely smooth, so completely, you know, well defined. There's no weird places of thresholds where I don't know what to do with uh, my how to value my nonlinearity. And the answer is yes. And the answer requires, and this is a very, I think, interesting idea, is that you start with uh, uh, with the information you get from one, and and then you compute topological invariants like column index and connection matrix uh, from this information, and there's some obviously uh, construction which has to be done. And that information should be valid for any smooth perturbation of, uh, of the kind of discontinuous function, which is in the first picture on top. Again, this is what we're working on to show that this is the case and, and make it as general as we can. Um, and I think that's, that's, that is correct. So in some sense, this very discrete calculus, which I described, uh, <clears throat> which comes from monotone Boolean functions and, and uh, finite collections of these and finite collection of uh, dynamics is, is again produced by uh, these discrete update functions. All of that is inherently computable, but it gives you a solid information about dynamics of a smooth uh, differential equation systems, albeit the ones which are kind of close or not so close to uh, to the ODE, which is on the, in the first picture. So let me kind of close this first part by um, kind of a cartoon, which I like. The cartoon on the right is very old, and I should find out where that is. It's some some book in the 70s or 60s or something, um, which is it? I mean, you're laughing. Do you know where it's from? Anyway. And it basically looks like everything in Zeman's um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Catastrophe yeah, theory as books. As far as, right? as far as, uh, right? Very so, recognizable. Yeah. So this is this is a kind of a like general dynamics cartoon, right? So you have, we have a parameter space, which is the horizontal plane on the bottom. In the vertical direction, we have dynamics. Uh, this is a picture of a uh, kind of a typical, um, and there's a different name, swallowtail bifurcation, where I have, um, uh, you know, in the middle triangle here, I have three different equilibria, otherwise I have one, there is a several bifurcations, whatever, right? So this is kind of a picture which we are looking at. Um, the anal analogous picture, which we want to think about, but again, obviously in much higher dimensions uh, here, is that on the left side, we have a parameter graph, which describes these domains um, of the parameter space, finitely many of them. And then in a vertical direction, Dynamics is described by Morse graphs, uh, which again arise from the state transition graphs. All of this is inherently combinatorial and and finite, i.e., computable. Clearly, the, the 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 type of information you are getting this is kind of, kind of circling back to um, the early comments that we're not tracing trajectories. The type of information you're getting uh, here is um, in terms of sets. Uh, invariant sets, um, uh, forward attracting sets, but there's information in in the in on the left side here. For instance, I can ask, does the system support bistability? And every one of those graphs, which has two red dots on the bottom, that's a bistable system. I can ask, 
are there stable periodic, is, is there potential for stable periodic orbits? If we look at say gene networks, um, which are implicated in, um, in cell cycle, you can ask for, and I'll do some applications here, uh, states which correspond to different uh, phenotypes uh, related to cancer. Right? So that, that we want, we're not tracking solutions. We cannot uh, say, oh, this solution is uh, you know, better uh, fitting your data than the other one, um, because we're not inspiring to one. And second, the, the data which comes from biology and this things in this, uh, this kind of realm at this time are usually like order of magnitude data, right? So if you are trying to fit, I would say, if you try to fit a Ranga Kata fourth order solution uh, to something which has uh, order of magnitude error bars, that's little, uh, that's not quite uh, uh, matching correct, match, matching the, um, the, uh, the coarseness. So with that, I'm going to um, try to now move to some of the applications. And uh, I'll mention only two, so I'll leave some, some for questions. So one will be in synthetic biology, where we'll use these kind of cal calculations to suggest um, reasons why some synthetic network which people construct failed. And I'll talk about um, epithelial mesenchymal tra transition, which is a, can, a change in phenotype, which is implicated in, uh, for instance, um, uh, cancer metastasis. Okay. So um, this is a work which uh, has been, is kind of ongoing in collaboration and under the auspices of, um, of a DARPA project. Uh, and the idea which many people have around the country, the synthetic biologists, is to design networks which will, uh, which, you know, kind of do something like we have done in electronics. Take some, take some parts, build something together, maybe a logical gates, um, which can be put and implemented in somewhere in E. coli, and maybe in human, maybe in other places, and they will predictably uh, and reliably work as designed. I always make this example, which is probably obviously not realistic in any, any uh, uh, kind of a near future, uh, let's say I build a network which uh, can be impl implemented into human uh, in the liver or something where you, where the network is going to measure whether A, uh, uh, there's enough blood sugar or, or insulin in the blood, how much sugar is in insulin, maybe the state of, of the organs in terms of is it night, is it day, and based on these three inputs, we'll des decide if it should poke the islands of Alangaras to make more insulin or should do something else and, and, and uh, basically control the homeostasis of the insulin. And this is a much better way to treat diabetes than uh, popping pills or, or injecting insulin, okay? Now, obviously this is completely um, science fiction at this point. And the, one of the reasons is that these things do not work as electronics, okay? So here's, a work, here's two labs which are trying to build, um, they have built, uh, these kind of repressive based NOR gates, these are logical gates. <clears throat> one works in E. coli, the other one are kind of CRISPR-Cas, which is the new, uh, the new biology coming out in you know, the last couple of years uh, in the East. And so here's kind of what they, what they come up with, right? So let's say I wanna build, again, this is all toys at this point. Um, let's say I have two inputs, A and B, which I can control. These are inputs where I you know, douse the cells with chemical A or chemical B. Right, and I can either put put both of them in, or none of them, or one of them, and I would like to design the kind of a circuit here, in a way that the, the GFP at the very end is the green fluorescent protein, which is going to shine or not shine. That's the output here, and I would like to get the truth table implemented, which is on on, on the right, which is a NAND gate, i.e., I would like to get the high expression of GFP in three conditions and low in the other one condition. Okay. So there, there exists now softwares um, uh, in both places, I think mostly in, in, at MIT, where you give the software the right-hand side here, the, the, the truth table, and it will make a design on the left where all these little kind of a weird shaped uh, fat arrows represent a NOR gate um, and uh, it will say, okay, this is how you should build this particular truth function, which is on the right. 
And here are the particular R1, R2, R3, R7, all these chemicals or all, all these genes, which you should do and implement, right? And there's a big input uh, into this where you have response functions and how these chemicals work and all these individual pieces are kind of well characterized. So they build this, you know, they kind of, it, it actually goes all the way from the truth table on the right to a, a plasmid design, which is a piece of DNA you can stick into E. coli um, representing the, the thing on the left. Okay. Now, what you have, what, how you measure if the network works, you present, you take a bunch of cells, you divide them into four pieces and you present in each of the you know, beakers, you put a either A and B both or only A, only B or none, right? So you basically test your logical circuit and what you are measuring is the, 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 the light, the floor, the, by flow cytometry, you measure, you count the number of cells which are, um, which are bright green and which are not. And here's the histograms, kind of what you get. What you should be seeing here are four different histograms. Three are colored blue and one is colored red. The three blue ones are the ones which should be high fluorescent protein because three of the four outputs should be high and one should be low. And you get this and you go like, okay, that did not work because clearly I have two zeros and I have two ones. And I'm expecting, I was designing this thing to have a three ones and one zero. And now you have to figure out what went wrong, right? And again, every single part is well characterized. So here are the things which could go wrong and this is why the synthetic biology does not have yet, uh, uh, you know, the answer to our diabetes issue. There can be a crosstalk, and crosstalk just means that uh, I did not design my chemicals correctly, and say the R2 chemical actually combined to R1 and R7 domains and just mess up the whole network. Okay? You can also have a similar in inference because you are putting it into living living organism, and those organisms. Um, do talk to your uh, to your network, and they may talk to it in a way that you do not expect. It may, for instance, um, uh, activate some of those things without you knowing or planning for it, or repress some things without you uh, planning for it. So what we can do is to provide suggestions of of um, of what could have been wrong in the following way. So what we can do is to transfer and transform this uh, logical circuit into a network in our language. And uh, we can ask whether, uh, if I now, if I add additional edges to the network, if I say, okay, I'm gonna put more, more parts, uh, more um, uh, pieces. I'm, I'm gonna look at the network space. I have just one network and I look at all, not all the neighbors, but a lot of different neighbors. I'm adding edges, adding uh, crosstalk edges, I add outside edges, I add nodes. And for each of those networks, I compute this decomposition, which I described of the, all the parameters and ask, is there a collection? Is there a parameter node, i.e. collection of, of these monotone Boolean functions, which are, um, which would reproduce the 0011 uh, logic, which I observed. And I, obviously there's many options which can, which can be wrong, but I can, uh, filter those options and tell you what are the uh, possibilities which are most likely causing uh, this failure, okay? And so this, this kind of uh, tool reduces the possible tests of everything failing, you know, trying to find everything experimentally to suggestions of the most proximal causes of what could go wrong, okay? So that's one, um, one of the uh, the issues which we which I want to talk about. The other one is more, and I okay, I'm I'm probably doing okay in time. So epithelial mesenchymal transition um, is a kind of a very popular network uh, to study. In, in and the re one reason is the following: in in cancer, you know, we always hear about mutations which lead to cancer, and it's true that the normal tissue does not, you know, it's not cancerous by definition. And you have to have multiple uh, 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 mutations, which will disable different parts of, of, the, of the genome to, to, to become a cancer cell. But there's a difference, there's a stage where the cancer becomes metast metastatic st uh, can uh, cancer, which means that you, you have to change the phenotype 
of a cell which sits tightly in some of the tissue and talks to all its neighbors to a phenotype where a cell kind of detaches from that tissue, goes to the bloodstream, moves someplace else and starts a new tumor. That does not seem to be caused by, uh, by mutation. This is simply not a genetic change. This is a phenotypic change. And um, this, the phenotype is sometimes important. Like this phenotype is used every time you have a little injury because the cells uh, have to mute, migrate to a place where the injury happened and uh, form a new tissue. So this is a change, which is you go from uh, epithelial, i.e. in the epithelium in, in, the, um, in the tissue cell to a migrant cell. And then you again become, a, become you, you reverse this phenotype change and you become a tissue embedded cell. Okay? But obviously if this goes wrong uh, and these, this phenotype happens for a cell which is, uh, which is cancerous, this could get wrong. It has a wrong consequences. So here's a network which people uh, think about as, as one of the networks which they think kind of uh, contains all uh, important uh, players. They have the bottom two things here, ECAD and Vimentim are markers for the two different phenotypes, okay? The epithelial phenotype and, and the mesenchymal phenotype. So what we have done here, uh, okay, let me kind of summarize more of the experimental stuff before I, I kind of describe what we have done, which is very descriptive. Um, it is, so TGF beta is one of the uh, inducers. Uh, it's one of these, this is TGF beta here in the center top. It's one of the uh, known inducers, external TGF beta of this, um, of this phenotype. But not every cell actually does transition from the metast to the, uh, from the, um, to the mesenchymal phenotype. There exists some intermediate phenotypes where the cells do not detach completely, but they kind of form these clumps. So they're kind of still gluing to some cells, but not all the cells. And if these cells migrate in clumps, that actually is a bad, worse news because they have already their kind of neighbors and friends with them. And if they come to a new tissue, uh, they are more likely to be, uh, to be successful in this. So, so the questions which people are trying to ask and answer are how many of these intermediate phenotypes there exists, um, how they are positioned between these two things, and why is there this diversity of, in, of outcome? So we're trying to, we're going to try to answer some of these questions. We're still developing more tools which will answer these questions in a much better way. So first um, we look at this network and we um, realize that, you know, if I look at the mesenchymal state, let's say, it's going to be, it's upregulated by both uh, the ZEB1 and SNAIL1 on top of it. And it's downregulated down by OVO2. Um, and the other epithelial state is kind of similarly, kind of symmetric. It's downregulated by SNAIL and ZEB. So I can actually just not really think about these. This is kind of making the network a little more doable, but think about uh, the epithelial state as the one where the, these, um, uh, ZEB1 and SNAIL1 are very, very high, i.e. That, that's upregulating the, the right hidden part. And the OVO is very, very low and vice versa. The, M, the mesenchymal state is represented by uh, the opposite where the ZEB and SNAIL are very low and OVO is high, okay? So in a, kind of a this is a six dimensional phase space, but again, I'm, uh, my phase space is discretized using these thresholds <clears throat> and here, the epithelial state is going to be in this three-dimensional projection, very, very low, and the M state is going to be very, very high. Okay, so this is kind of a, um, the description of the, again, three-space projection of six-dimensional space. Uh, what you should, I'm going to talk about briefly about kind of the layers here. So that what colors represent are the distances between the E and M state, right? So like these red, um, red layer next to M state is a one change away from M state. The yellow is two changes. The black is three changes, right? So I'm kind of layering things over to, to count the distance between those two states. So then um, the other thing which I want to talk about briefly is that you know, my parameter graph um, has layers. So I'm going to ask how these states change as I increase TGF beta. TGF beta is one of the nodes in the network. And therefore, there is a corresponding parameter graph corresponding to that node. And the parameter graph may look like this. 
So I'm going to group these nodes in layers. On the left side, I didn't quite explain that, but on the left side corresponds to expression levels, which are very, very low. On the right side, which are very, very high. And as you go from left to right, your expression level of TG of beta is going, in this case, it's oval to, it goes from low, low to high. So this is my representation of this inducement of the phenotypic change. Um, I don't want to talk about this too much. Uh, we, this network is quite large and the size of the uh, parameter graphs are in a billion. And so what we have done, we concentrate on something which is called essential nodes, which are basically nodes where every single edge and everything in the network is functional. Because if I have, and by functional, I mean where uh, if I have expression level of some node, which is always, always very low, and it does not incite or induce anything downstream, I can just take those edges out. They don't work. They're not really active. And there's a precise definition of this, but this allows me to uh, concentrate on a smaller set of nodes, a smaller set of, 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 of these monotone Boolean functions, which, are, which I can compute with. So even with this, we have a 38 dimensional parameter space and six dimensional phase space. And here are some observations. Um, first of all, this network seems to be pretty special because the, all these essential parameter nodes only have fixed points as attractive. There's never a periodic orbit or anything else, but a steady state as in the attractor. Okay? Uh, all these essential nodes do have both states present. Okay? Typical Morse graphs are pretty big. So this is a typical Morse graph we compute. So what you see is in this particular case, and you should notice there's the two FPs on, a, on the top, which are detached. This is just the graphics. What this system has is six stable states. And they're denoted the two on the top and four on the bottom. And all these XC things are partial oscillations, which are unstable and partial oscillation in the three things which are in the bracket. So the three genes which are in the bracket, the three proteins are oscillating. The other ones do not. And this is kind of a structure as you go from the top to the bottom, how the flow would go down, okay? But every single one of them has, um, has uh, this, the fixed points. So under this TGF induction, and I'll try to do this in a couple minutes here, what you see again, if you go from left to right, on the left side are the layers at each TGF beta is very low, on the right, very high. So as I go from left to right, I'm kind of accounting for all possible other. So I'm just changing one, I'm moving in one parameter graph, but all the other parameter graph, I, I kind of summarize over, sum over. So what I see is that um, as expected, if the TGF beta is low, um, I have epithelial state, and this is counting only monostable. So there's only one fixed point, the whole phase space, everything moves to one fixed point, which is the, epi the monostable epithelial state. That's a state which is expected. On the very high end of uh, induction, I see the other state, which is the uh, kind of cancerous mo mobile state where things can move on, 25% of all parameters. So what happens in the other one? Well, um, if you actually look at all states, so what you see on the left here, if the, again, TG beta is very low, actually every single node has a uh, epithelial state but only 25% have, have that as a solo FP. The other 75% are in a, in a partnership with somebody else, right? In, with some other stable fixed point. So that means that there is a potential, uh, uh, potential for a lot of hysteresis here, okay? And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on because this, can, again, this is a whole work here uh, but I can look at where the other fixed point, what kind of other fixed points are there. And here, what you see on the bottom are um, number of parameter domains, which have an equilibrium, the other equilibrium, the, the stable equilibria, which are these intermediate st uh, states, which are interesting to biologists in different layers of the hypercube of the cube, which I showed you, three-dimensional cube. So the colors here represent the light blue is a, uh, one away from the epithelial state, the, the what is it, violet, two steps, 
three steps is the layers across the cube, which I talked about. The other things which we can look at, again, I'm just illustrating the power of the of what we can do with these kind of uh, um, tools in a very high dimensional space and a very high dimensional phase space. We can ask how many these how many uh, stable states can coexist. Again, this is kind of talking about. In every one of the parameter nodes, I have both epithelial and mesenchymal states, but are there the other ones? What you see, there's up to eight stable states, in a, and they're all concentrated in the very middle uh, of this domain, kind of in the middle region. In the in the end region, things are much more uh, much more monostable, but there could be uh, a lot of a lot of intermediate state states. Again, we're talking to some biologists to see if we can map this and kind of see if this is something which is of interest and in how we can uh, um, do this. But we have found a lot more intermediate states than uh, the experimentalists have done so far. But how robust these are and how, how far they are perturbable from this kind of infinite, in, from this discrete um, uh, ODEs to a finite ODEs is yet to be seen. So let me conclude here in a, um, in a, a minute or two. So. The, this new description of, of network dynamics relies on kind of three things. On the parameter graph, which is kind of the, uh, we can think about it as a collection of combinatorial state transition graphs, but also as a collection of monotone Boolean functions, which are compatible with the network. Um, and then the phase space, which is the state transition graph, which can be uh, compressed uh, in terms of Morse graphs. And interpretable, you know, the, the, the way to the, the continuous parameterization and continuous phase space um, allows this kind of interpretation in terms of parameter graph uh, as, as a collection of Boolean functions, but also there's a topological uh, explain or interpretation um, of these Morse sets in terms of attracting blocks which can then be perturbed to smooth uh, differential equations. Okay, so again, there's there's a lot of stuff which I have not, I just kind of touched on and I did not talk about. And the main thing I want to kind of emphasize here, that there's a change of perspective of what dynamics we should be expecting from these networks. We're not trying to track individual solutions uh, for these very poorly defined ODEs. We're like mostly interested in the kind of set theoretical and robust features, uh, which are still interpretable. There's a lot of uh, sources which I can, I'm very happy to talk about if anybody's interested. Um, and uh, I'm closing with thank you for a generous funding from multiple organizations. And I'm done and I'm going to stop sharing. And I thank you very much for your attention. If I can do that. I don't know how amazing my cursor is. <laughs> You're stuck. I'm stuck. But as long as you're stuck, do people have questions? Yes. Talk already. Yes. So thank you for this very, very nice talk. I have a question that it kind of alluded to it uh, a few times. So what's the computational complexity of that approach? So you start with a particular network that they, they give you, and then you calculate your graphs, uh, your functional graphs, et cetera, et cetera. So how big, of the, uh, how big can be the initial graph that is given to you? That's a very good question. Uh, the, the complexity of computation really depends on uh, the size of the parameter graph. Uh, and again, it's a product. So the, the um, okay, size of primary graph depends on number of edges, right? It's like there's node plus the edges around. So it's not really, I can't really tell you if I, if you give me a network, which is a one big loop, which has 10,000 uh, units, but they're connected only to the neighbors, I can compute it uh, in a 0 0.2 seconds. But if I have a more dense network, it's going to be much more complicated. So. The, the bottleneck is how many kind of a node which has the highest number of inputs and outputs. And with that said, we can compute 
uh, with eight to 10, 15, well, 15 is probably the stretch, right? So we can compute with parameter graphs with about a billion nodes. Um, and again, that correspond to, depends on how many edges and how many edges, how dense the network is. The density is really dense, but dense means how many edges are, are connected. Thank but you. Constantly always has his better answer than me because he is, you know, and we can do big networks. I mean, again, the other thing is that you can only do, you can do it two different ways. You can either compute the entire database, i.e. you can compute uh, the entire parameter graph and store the information with each parameter node, you can store the Morse graph. That storage could be large, right? Could be gigabytes, uh, but you can compute it once and then you can just work on it and, and, um, and, and query that in multiple, in um, whatever questions you have. So in principle, we can store it once forever and you're done. The obviously storage is expensive. The other approach is just to ask a question and then just go through the calculation. And every time I come up with a node, answer the question and throw the node away. And, and if I need to answer that question, I can just do it again. And there are different advantages and disadvantages depending on how much storage you have and how much um, of a, yeah. Thanks. Ah. I've banished this. Other questions or comments? Uh, Tomas, I have one, if that's yep. okay. Um, so you, you defined at some point these essential parameter nodes, and I'm a bit unclear as to whether they were defined for computational ease or whether they are like somehow, you know, for biological or mathematical reasons that they are like the only part of this giant graph you'd ever have to care about. It wasn't obvious why or how those were selected. So if you could say a bit more, that would be nice. Very good question. So um, here, here's how I, 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 we can think about this, right? So if I have a network with you know, five, five edges, five nodes, let's say, then the, um, the, the, the data, database as I describe it, or collection of all the parameter, parameter nodes, parameter graph, contains not just that five node graph, but contains information of, of every single subgraph as well, right? So, you know, if I, kind of, um, if I look at a particular node in a graph and I move in the extreme direction, if I look at kind of the last, first or last layer in that parameter graph, that really represent either that, that node that does not affect the downstream genes at all because they're always very low or it's always very high. It never goes over a threshold of any one of them guys who I'm, who I'm affecting, right? So essentially you can just take those edges out because they're not really affecting anything. So that in that sense, you're looking at all the, all the sub, sub networks. So when I say essential, those parameter nodes, in, in terms of, 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 in terms of the uh, monotone Boolean functions, those represent functions which are constant, either one or zero, right? So if I have a function which is constant, I don't have to have that because that's not really there. Um, so the essential nodes are the ones where I'm really looking at a five node network, which I'm, which you gave me and not on any sub networks. And that saves definitely computations because I'm looking only at that five node networks and all, 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 not all the four node sub networks and three node, which is just obviously a huge number of things. Okay, so that's how I would explain that. Okay. Thanks. That makes sense. Let me just make a, a comment because it, it's something that we always struggle with. The direction that, that you asked and that Tomas explained is easily understood. Think of the opposite direction. Start with a small network and now try to embed it into a big network. Where are where in parameter graph are you? And and that that we still don't really understand. I mean, have, you'd have solved the subgraph isomorphism problem efficiently no, 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 if you no, understood they, it, right? No, it's, 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 um, it, it's, more, it's more complicated, well, I, more complicated than that. Yes, yeah, so, okay, okay, there's that problem, but that, that to me is the, the lesser of the problems, right? That's just hard to do. <laughs> I mean, okay, it takes a lot of time, but, but you know, so Tomas mentioned that, you know, you, you have this node in the graph and ima imagine it just has no output. All right, so it's not affecting the rest of the graph. Or imagine that it's, it's just blaring all the time. 
So again, you know, if the graph, the rest of the network is working with this guy producing tremendous amount of proteins, it, it again doesn't have any effect on the graph. So that I just gave you two ways to kind of embed that node into the big graph. You can embed it kind of at one end where it's nobody notices it there, and the other place where people just put on their headphones because it's it's screaming so loud, right? So, well. In general, if I give you a small network and I put it into a big network, how does it fit? I mean, there are many, many places. I mean, and so we have like, we have two competing uh, ideas, right? I'm a biologist, so I know like, okay, here's a natural way to do that. So there's, you know, there's, you take a small network and a bigger one, uh, you can, you can embed it in say 10 different ways, right? And Constance says, yes, we should do in 10 different ways. We should compute all of them, right? And I mean, that's a very natural mathematical way to do that. And I was like, no, no, let's just choose one of them, the one which is more most natural, which biologists would like, right? And they're both really valid and will really depends on how we, right? But there's fundamentally, you would like to get some kind of, you know, kind of categorical way to do that, which I don't think there is one, right? So. But yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very Thanks. good question. Other questions or comments? All right, well, we're gonna meet again in two weeks.